On Sunday mornings, we like to take our dogs for a walk to the local donut shop. It's a nice tradition and supports a local family-owned business. If you're in the market for a Sunday morning tradition, I hope you consider ours. If that's not your speed, I'd at least like to implore you to avoid Corporal Metz's apparent tradition of walking into the ground's maintenance facility on base, dumping fuel throughout, lighting a match, and letting it burn. This is Conduct Unbecoming. I'm Erin, and I'm your host. On Sunday, May 20th, 2018, the fire alarm in a facilities maintenance building aboard Marine Corps Base Camp Pendleton sliced through the quiet pre-dawn silence. Fire alarms in Southern California aren't a new or novel thing. The state famously catches fire a few times a decade with devastating results. Base firefighters responded to the 3.35 a.m. call and were able to tame the burn and extinguish the flames. Picking through the smoldering building, firefighters noted that the flames emanated from inside the building and appeared to start in five separate locations within one room. If there were any doubts that this was not spontaneous combustion, let me resolve those. The most intense flames were from a cluster of lawn mowers that had been set alight. There were no signs of forced entry on any of the exterior doors, but inside they did find a few interior locks that had been cut, along with a pair of bolt cutters. They also found a log book and hard hat with sergeant chevrons that had been placed atop a stack of lumber and burned. Finding all these clues, firefighters alerted NCIS, the Naval Criminal Investigative Service, to what they believed was arson. I know I mentioned in episode 4 that appellate opinions from the various military courts only seem to name investigators they think performed shoddy work. What I perhaps didn't mention is that when the courts give them anonymized names, they usually pick the phonetic alphabet that corresponds with the first letter of someone's last name. I share all that to note that throughout this opinion, the investigating NCIS agent is referred to as Special Agent Papa, which just makes me smile. In lieu of assigning my own pseudonym, I'll adopt the court's name and will refer to him as Agent Papa as well. Agent Papa was an experienced arson investigator and had worked on at least 100 arson cases, including 25 structure fire arsons. His first stop in investigating this fire was to go to the staff non-commissioned officer, the staff NCO, in charge of the facility's maintenance building and ask who had access to the building, specifically who had keys to the building. The staff NCO named 10 Marines he knew had keys, but, he explained, that sometimes the keys got passed to others. So while there was this list of names of people with keys, he couldn't really provide a definitive list as to who had access. When the agent shared the description of the logbook and hard hat with Sergeant Chevrons, the staff NCO said they belonged to a sergeant who had recently counseled Corporal Bradley Metz. Counseling in this context is not brought to you by Talkspace, but rather by the disappointment of watching Metz do something wrong and telling him to do better. The staff NCO explained that Corporal Metz was a, quote, problem child and that he had a bad grudge. But, the staff NCO explained, most of the Marines in the shop were disgruntled. And I kind of get being a little bit grumbly. 
The recruitment ads don't exactly feature the ground's maintenance team, and I could understand being displeased with the tasks of mowing and weeding the base. The staff NCO told special agents that both Corporal Metz and another Marine who had a key lived on the second floor of a nearby barracks building. Armed with that information, Agent Papa and his colleague went to visit the Marines at the nearby barracks. When they got there, they found Metz's door first. They found his door propped open by the deadbolt. They called out to Metz, who responded, It's open. However, much like vampires, investigators really need something a bit more explicit before they walk into a residence. And they explained that they'd prefer if Metz came to the door. They identified themselves as special agents, and Metz introduced himself. The agents explained that they were investigating an incident at Metz's workplace and asked if they could come inside to speak with him. He said that was no problem and opened the door. Vampire access granted. Once they were inside, they asked if he knew anything about what happened at the facility's maintenance building earlier that morning, but Metz said he didn't. They talked with him about his key to the building and asked if he still had it. Metz shared that he loaned the key to a friend and implied they were lost, that he'd even filed a report about them. While looking around the room, Agent Papa noticed a pair of Nikes hanging on the towel hooks inside the bathroom. The insoles were removed and drying nearby on the toilet paper holder. Agent Papa asked if the shoes were Nikes, and then asked if he could take a look at them. Metz told him that wasn't a problem, and as Agent Papa got closer to the shoes, instead of sniffing out the smell of sweaty feet, he began to pick up the overwhelming odor of fuel. Metz must have had his back to Agent Papa, who looked past him to his colleague and made the throat-slashing motion with one hand to signal it was time to split. The special agents wound down the conversation and, before leaving, asked Metz to let NCIS know if he had any more information about the fire. They returned to their car to discuss, and to stake out the dumpster. They felt certain Metz would try and dispose of the suspicious Nikes since they'd exited so abruptly after inspecting them. They waited for about 30 minutes, but Metz didn't appear. They thought... Maybe. There was some other reason Metz had fresh fuel on his sneakers. So they returned to the room and discovered Metz had moved the incriminating shoes, but only to a ledge outside his door so they could finish drying out. I don't know if Metz is a sneakerhead, but I can tell you he wasn't just going to throw out a pair of Nikes. The agents knocked on the door again, but this time no one answered. Agent Papa left his colleague at the door and went to the duty officer to ask if he'd seen where Metz went. Instead, on his way to the desk, Agent Papa saw Metz walking toward the smoke pit, hands in pockets. Agent Papa called out, asking him to remove his hands from his pockets. He was apparently pretty slow to follow that directive, which allegedly made Agent Papa nervous. Very nervous. Agent Papa caught up and then cuffed and frisked Metz. I think he was checking for weapons in his pockets. Agent Papa then took Metz, cuffed, back to his room. Agent Papa told Metz he hadn't arrested him. He'd just detained him. He wanted the cuffs until he'd had an opportunity to, quote, get some stuff figured out. Back at Metz's room, the agents released him and asked for permission to search his barracks room, which Metz gave. He read and signed a permissive authorization for search and seizure form. That form listed the subject of the investigation. Arson. While in the room a second time, the agents didn't ask additional questions about the fire, but they did seize a handful of items. They gathered and took back the wet shoes and insoles that smelled of gasoline, along with a blue lighter, a single silver key, a crushed red cell phone from his trash can, and a bag of laundry containing a pair of black pants, a charcoal gray t-shirt, a white t-shirt, 
and a pair of boxers. All of the clothing produced a strong smell of gasoline. The agents took the items and Mets back to the NCIS office. On the drive, they talked mostly about food, but also asked about Metz's dissatisfaction with the Marine Corps. Upon arriving to the office, the agents advised Metz of his 31 Bravo rights, and tossed him a McDonald's cheeseburger. Perhaps Metz thought he could explain and correct whatever assumptions the agents made about him and his involvement. He shared that he'd been up late drinking with a friend, who'd recently returned from deployment. They'd gone to dinner together, returned to the friend's hotel, had a few drinks, and then Metz returned to his room at the barracks sometime after 12. He said he checked his Facebook, then fell right asleep. He'd only woken up at 9 or 10 that morning, and he'd had no idea there'd been a fire until he later drove past the burned building on the way to the gym at around 11 a.m. He said he'd passed the burned building but didn't know how the fire started. But if Metz left his barracks and drove past the building, there was no gym in that direction. And there was still the issue of the smell. Metz explained that he'd been working on his car three or four days beforehand and that's why his clothes smelled of gasoline which, for the record, does nothing to explain why his shoes and insoles were still soaking wet. Gasoline evaporates quickly when it's exposed to air, and even more quickly if that air is warm. San Diego at sea level in May isn't exactly known for overwhelmingly cold temperatures. One of the agents came into the interrogation room with a UV flashlight and shined it on Metz's hands. They told him the UV light confirmed the presence of accelerants, that his hands had tested positive. It's worth taking a moment here to note that they were admittedly lying. For those who aren't in the know, it's legal for police to lie. The single silver key they seized in Metz's room wasn't for anything at the facility's maintenance building, so the agents knew they were still missing some pieces. At around 11 p.m., the NCIS agents released Metz, and he returned to his barracks room. There, he pulled out his phone and called the friend whose name he'd given as an alibi witness. He told his friend that if anyone from NCIS contacted him, tell them they'd been at dinner together, that they went back to the friend's hotel, they drank a specific beer, and that Metz got dropped off at his barracks room between midnight and 1 a.m. The following day, the agents requested that the command return Metz to NCIS for a second interview. When he arrived, he handed over his cell phone and smartwatch, which were placed into a locker. He consented to NCIS obtaining his financial information and declined to be interviewed for a second time. Metz finally asked for a lawyer. When NCIS then requested permission to search his cell phone and smartwatch, Metz declined. He did, however, consent to a second search of his barracks room. In that second search of his barracks room, NCIS found a pair of black gloves that smelled of fuel and another physical key, hidden inside a tissue box, the key to the facility's maintenance building. Checking the logs, agents learned Metz had never reported the key as either lost or missing. Metz was arrested and his command ordered him into pretrial confinement. While he was in pretrial confinement, a handful of dumpsters went up in flames on base. Camp Pendleton had another little firebug running around. At trial, the government's fire expert testified that the fires were intentionally set. And the defense expert agreed. The fires were started with a combination of gasoline and biodiesel fuel. 
chemical analysis confirmed matching fuels were found on Metz's clothes, shoes, and gloves. There was so much fuel on his belongings that even six months after the fire, the panel at Metz's court-martial was able to smell the fuel still on the items. The fuel mixture couldn't have come from working on his car, though that was the explanation he offered. In addition to the interesting mix, when NCIS examined Metz's car, they discovered an incriminating layer of road grime. It was clear Metz hadn't been working on the car, and there wasn't any kind of fuel leak. When NCIS pulled the access log for his barracks room, they found that Metz first entered his room on Saturday, May 19th at 8.14 p.m. He hadn't been out drinking with his fresh-from-deployment hometown friend. He hadn't gotten home after midnight. Metz had gone to dinner with his friend, with his friend, his friend's wife, and his friend's daughter. But they finished by 7 p.m., which is not exactly the bender that Metz described. Then, Metz used his keycard again at 3.36 a.m. on Sunday, May 20th. About a minute after the smoke set off the fire alarm at his work site, three-tenths of a mile from his barracks room. And NCIS did talk to everyone else who had keys to the building. All of them had alibis. There's nothing in the appellate opinion regarding who the other firebug was. The defense argued that whoever was out there living their best dumpster fire life could have also been the person that waltzed into the facility's management building without forcing their way in and lit five separate fires. Given the dissimilarities between the different acts of arson, the defense was unconvincing. Metz pleaded not guilty but was nevertheless convicted of one specification of arson, one specification of housebreaking, and one specification of unlawful entry. The military judge conditionally dismissed the specification of unlawful entry as an unreasonable multiplication of charges, given the housebreaking charge. An unreasonable multiplication of charges is when a prosecutor charges in the alternative. It's allowed, and here the prosecutor charged both housebreaking and unlawful entry for the same basic conduct. Metz entered a space where he wasn't welcome or allowed. The prosecutors figured they could get Metz on either theory, so they charged both. But it's not particularly fair to serve double the time for alternate theories, so the court conditionally dismisses the lesser offense. Here, that meant conditionally dismissing the unlawful entry specification. The judge dismisses it conditionally, because if, on appeal, the housebreaking conviction gets tossed, the unlawful entry conviction can be reinstated. Metz received a sentence of confinement for one year, forfeiture of all pay and allowances, a bad conduct discharge, and reduction from E4 to E1. On appeal, Metz raised four assignments of error, including a violation of his constitutional rights as a suspect, ineffective assistance of counsel, and legal and factual insufficiency. I think the most interesting matter is an issue of criminal procedure Metz raised. He asserted that he was a suspect when NCIS agents initially spoke with him at his room prior to discovering the gasoline-soaked Nikes. That matters because there's a substantial difference between having a friendly chat with investigators and having a chat with investigators when you're a suspect. There are different constitutional rights implicated when you're a suspect under the laws that govern criminal procedure. Defense argued during pretrial motions that NCIS failed to advise Met of his Article 31B rights, his Article 31 Bravo rights, when they spoke with him at his barracks room. Article 31B of the Uniform Code of Military Justice codifies a suspect's right against self-incrimination. They are a slightly different flavor of the Miranda warning, 
a suspect must be advised of their 31B rights each time they are questioned, not just while they're in police custody. And a suspect must be informed of the nature of the accusation. Article 31B does not require investigators to tell a service member that they have a right to counsel. So I guess if you're a service member listening to this podcast, just remember that little nugget on your own. Failing to advise a suspect of their 31B rights makes an interrogation unlawful, and the evidence obtained can get thrown out. The trial judge denied Metz's motion, finding the NCIS agents did not suspect Metz when they had their first conversation, nor should they have. So what did the NCIS agents know when they walked over to the barracks building? NCIS knew the building had intentionally been burned. They knew there was no sign of forced entry. They knew there were maybe 10 people who should have keys to the building, but an unknown number of people who might have had access because the keys weren't tightly held and people passed them around. They knew Metz had a talking to from a sergeant, that Metz may have had a grudge, and that the sergeant's logbook and hard hat were near one of the five sources of fire. They also knew that most people in the shop were seemingly disgruntled. They knew Metz and one other Marine from the shop lived in the nearby barracks. They started their inquiry with the first Marine they found after entering the barracks, Metz. Metz agreed to talk with the NCIS agents and on appeal argued that he was already a suspect when he made his initial statements. The argument flows that without the initial statements, NCIS wouldn't have seen, or I guess smelled, the Nikes. They wouldn't have asked permission to search his barracks room, and consequently, all the evidence that NCIS obtained after Metz made his unwarned statements was fruit of the poisonous tree. The Navy and Marine Corps Court of Criminal Appeals, the NMCCA, made some important distinctions. They clarified that when NCIS knocked on Metz's door, he wasn't a suspect. He was, at best, a person of interest. Metz graduated from a person of interest when the eye-watering smell of fuel began to burn Agent Papa's nostrils. When Metz graduated to suspect, NCIS extracted themselves from the encounter. It's not quite enough that these two NCIS agents didn't suspect Metz of arson when they started their conversation. The court had to answer whether the reasonable person would have suspected Metz of arson. While the NCO talked about a possible grudge related to the sergeant, his logbook, and his hard hat, that was one of at least five sources of ignition. And he admitted that multiple people in the shop were grumpy. I think it would be a bit of a stretch to say that the hard hat and comment from the NCO elevates Metz above any of the other grumpy people who may have had access to the building. The questions the NCIS agents asked in that initial unwarned conversation were geared towards determining whether Metz knew anything about the incident and establishing an alibi if he had one. This wasn't really an example of police gone wild. The investigators here behaved in the exact way we'd expect investigators aware of the law and their duties to behave. Metz wasn't a suspect when they began their conversation, and when he became a suspect, they left. I so firmly believe that, that when I read the fact section of this opinion, I honestly thought the issue on appeal was going to focus on the handcuffing. The NMCCA found that when Agent Papa put the cuffs on Metz, he was concerned, presumably for his safety, because Metz was slow to take his hands from his pockets. Because of this concern, they decided, Agent Papa's cuff and frisk was lawful. It became a problem after the frisk, when Agent Papa apprehended Metz nevertheless and held him in cuffs for at least three minutes. While the NMCCA determined that this brief apprehension was unlawful, 
They also concluded that the cuffs didn't taint the consent Metz gave for searching his room. I know Metz has appealed to the Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces, but I don't see anything out of them just yet on his matter. Stay tuned for updates if I get them. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed today's episode, please remember to subscribe and rate the podcast. I invite you to submit case suggestions and feedback to conductunbecomingpod at gmail.com or on conductunbecomingpod.com. Join me next time when I delve deep into a very bad breakup. Until then, take care. Conduct and Becoming is a podcast where I get to talk about interesting crimes and cases that involve U.S. military service members. I research, write, and produce the podcast myself. The opinions expressed are my own, and perhaps it's obvious, Conduct and Becoming is not approved, authorized, or endorsed by the Department of Defense.